Yagoyangan Gomwalev, Eda in Kelina Lam in Mikitogan Island Gainar. Hello, everybody. My name is Selena Lam, and I am from the Marshall Islands. I am a climate warrior, a spoken word performer, and a poet. My home is located halfway between Hawaii and Australia. We are a large ocean nation of 30, 34 islands and atolls all put together, and that makes up 182 kilometers of land. We are a large ocean nation. And for context, the 182 kilometers of land is a little bit over the size of Washington, D.C. in the U.S. And all of our lands and islands are scattered over 200,000 kilometers of ocean territory. Pretty big. Hence, large ocean nation. We are often referred to also as barely their dots on the map. And one of my asks for today is if you have access to the internet and a device to use Google Map or any other kind of map, look up the Marshall Islands. And please be very, very patient with it. The zooming in is going to take some time. And so for the Marshall Islands, often when it is headlining the news, it is often related to these two topics, the climate crisis and nuclear legacy. For the entire world, these two topics can seem very unrelated. But in a country like mine, they intersect. They are very much connected. And now, I am 24 years old, soon to be 25 this weekend. <laughs> I have never not known the climate crisis. Like many of my generation, I do not know what the world looks like without climate crisis. It has been my lifetime and my reality. Even when I did not know what it was named as a child, I saw, heard, felt, smelt, and touched it. This image you see is of our international airport on Mijiro Atoll, the capital where I was born and raised. On average, the Marshall Islands is two meters above sea level. As you can see here, in many points of the island, you can stand in the middle and you'll see both the ocean side and the lagoon side. I've heard from people flying into Mijiro for the first time, sharing their recollection of how scared they were when they first landed on Mijiro. Because as they're up there, they see this strip of land. But as soon as the plane descends, they no longer see land, but just water from their window. And they think they're landing into water. 96% of Mijiro itself is vulnerable to climate-induced floodings. Since 1993, we've seen our waters rise to 7 millimeters per year, compared to the 3.6 millimeters per year of global average. That is more than twice the amount. During king tide seasons, and this is when the waves are at their highest, my childhood is filled with sounds of trucks hauling sand, the claws grating on the ground, sort of like the groan of a monster in the movies. As they haul these sands to create sand walls to prevent the incoming tides from flooding people's homes. Our seawalls the next day are left gaping, only to be stitched back 
by our uncles and our grandfathers as they work hard under the sun. And our mothers and our grandmothers all are huddled in the house to cook and prepare meals for them to replenish with after. As you walk through ankle-deep water, you notice the vegetables browning and wither from the assault of salty water. My late grandpa would empty an entire package of Roma powder detergent into a bucket that we had filled from our underwater well because it was time to wash up. And he was worried that whatever the waves had vomited onto our lands would have seeped into our underwater well and we would get contaminated by it. As I've been working and studying abroad, every year I see pictures and videos of floodings or another drought for my people. And while it all angers and scares me, it only gives me the strength and fortifies me to continue fighting for our denied future. Because these islands are the resting grounds of my beloved ones. And for them to rest in peace, their home must remain where it is. The floodings is just one of the many effects that the climate crisis has in the Marshall Islands. Now, how does it intersect with the nuclear legacy? Between 1946 and 1958, the Marshall Islands was used as a nuclear testing site by the United States government. 67 nuclear weapons dropped in the Marshall Islands. The most infamous one, the Castle Bravo bomb, was dropped and it is the biggest hydrogen bomb that the US has ever detonated in their history. And this was dropped in our island of Bikini Atoll. I am positive that we all know the bathing suit bikini. History lesson. The Castle Bravo bomb evoked sensational reactions from the entire world. So much so, the French designer of the bikini, of the bathing suit, seeing this, expected a similar response once his bathing suit was launched. Therefore, he named it Bikini, after our island. This bomb is equivalent to 1.2 Hiroshima bomb dropped every single day for 12 years. And while the people from Bikini Atoll were relocated, all of those from nearby islands were not informed. They saw the blast, the mushroom cloud. They felt the tremors as it traveled through the earth to the bottom of their feet. And the wind that the United States claimed they had miscalculated, only to be proven later to be false, blew the white fallout to all the nearby islands in the Marshall Islands. And people saw this white fallout and they thought it was snow. So they started playing in it. They started eating it. Immediately, people became sick. New diseases were introduced to our population. And one that wrecked us most and terrorized the wombs of our mothers and gave us what we call jellyfish babies. The 
The contamination on my islands is equivalent to, is akin to the ones in Chernobyl and Fukushima. Probably one of the most visible symbol of this nuclear legacy is on Eniwetak Atoll, the Runut Dome, or as the locals call it, the tomb, over here. Built by the US government in an incomplete attempt to clean up the nuclear waste, this dome houses three million cubic feet of nuclear waste. A sign that was there said, do not return for 25,000 years. That sign has now been washed away by the water. And this dome doesn't have a base. It is cracking and eroding. With alarming and extreme weather events from the climate crisis, this does not bode well for my people and for the world. This dome is leaking. And they found traces of it because we share the same ocean. The currents carry what is in my waters to yours. And they found traces of it in Japan and the US and many other parts. What also doesn't bode well for my people is headlines or words like, must visit islands before they disappear. Probably the last time you see these countries' flags. Or my very favorite one, <laughs> good luck. You're already erasing my culture and my heritage when you say these things, without even trying. We contribute to less than 0% of the global carbon emissions. Good luck diminishes the relentless work of frontline communities. It releases colonial and fossil fuel entities from accountability and responsibility. It separates you from me and I from you when we all live on the same planet. Our late ambassador for climate change, Tony De Bruyne, once said, we are not here to save just the Marshall Islands. We are here to save the world. Because once what happened in my backyard is now in your backyard, just in a different form. The climate crisis affects all of us. In varying degrees, yes, but it does. To drown out good luck, we are out on the streets in protest, shouting, we are not drowning, we are fighting. We are not drowning, we are fighting. Streaming into climate spaces to be our own advocates. It is important to know that in many of these spaces of discussions and decision making, it's the stark missing physical representation of people who are affected and from marginalized communities using the mediums of art, like storytelling, spoken word, performances, or music, to create a safe space for our climate anxiety and grief, and also to make the language of climate science accessible to the general public. Voting for leaders whose agenda aligns with the wellness and the longevity of our planet and all its inhabitants writing to leaders on what must be done, suing government and countries for their continued inaction, empower our indigenous leaders, for they are the sole keepers of our lands and our cultures to proliferate and implement indigenous knowledge and, back, and practices back into our daily life. 
To be an ally is to listen to, work with, give space and amplify the voices of frontline communities. And it is for our home that I refuse to accept words like yet and good luck. Como Thank you.